With all the legal upset caused by the U.S. Supreme Court this year, there's been a lot of talk about how the highest court in the land functions and whether it's still functioning the way it's supposed to. Is this how courts in similar countries function? Is there a way to improve how it functions so it's not just making up laws or throwing out laws after literal decades of precedent and so it's not allowing for political power plays by letting a single president appoint a large portion of the bench with no term limits in sight or allowing justices to retire at opportune moments to benefit one party or the other? This can't be the only way, right? Right. Today we're gonna look at how other countries' Supreme Courts function and whether it might make sense to move away from the monstrosity that we currently have. Let's discuss. You know what I like to do when the weight of the world feels overwhelming? Sleep. I love to sleep. I prioritize sleep above, I think, literally everything else. If I don't get a full eight hours, I'm a monster. And I love my bed. Having a good bed, as you probably know, is important to getting good sleep. And I'd like to thank my sponsor for today's video, Helix Sleep. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs and conveniently shipped right to your door. Helix made a sleep quiz that you can take to match your unique body and sleep preferences because everyone's different and needs different things out of their mattress. And Helix Sleep has something for everyone's unique taste. And if you share your bed with a partner, you can even take the quiz together to find a good compromise for both of you. Based on my results, Helix matched me with their Midnight Mattress, which I obviously upgraded to a Lux because I only deserve the best, frankly. I'm a side sleeper. I do the running man position, you know, like I'm trying to run away in my sleep. I love a middle of the road firmness, very Goldilocks, not too soft, not too firm. And then you can personalize the mattress even more by adding the Glacio Tex cooling cover, which helps keep the bed cool and comfortable, which has been absolutely essential during the hot summer months. I've had my Helix mattress for about two months now, and it truly is really comfortable. I get great sleep on it, which is imperative because as a 30 year old lady, one wrong turn and I have neck pain for a week now. So I need a mattress that can support this old bag of bones. And it was really easy to have it just shipped right to my door. The shipping is free and it comes rolled up in a box that's super easy to set up. An absolute all around win. With your Helix sleep mattress, you get a 100 night sleep trial along with a 10 year warranty. And there are financing options and flexible payment plans available as well. So if you're nervous to buy a mattress that you haven't had a chance to try out, you get more than three months to make sure that you love it. And if you don't, they'll literally come to your house and pick it up for you and you'll get a full refund. I love my Helix and I think you will too. If you're looking for a brand new bed, check out Helix, click the link in the description or go to helixsleep.com slash Lija for up to $200 off your Helix sleep mattress plus two free pillows. And they are some really great pillows too. Thanks Helix. All right, let's just go over the basics of how the U.S. Supreme Court works. The Supreme Court was created by the U.S. Constitution. Article three is all about the judiciary. Section one of Article three says, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. Side note, I recently kind of blew up on TikTok uh, because I literally read the entire U.S. Constitution out loud on TikTok. And one of my videos in my U.S. Constitution playlist is just me reading the entirety of Article 3. So if you really want the whole thing read to you, go check it out there where I'm also going to go over other bite-sized snippets all about constitutional law. My handle is at Legia Miller. Shameless plug. Anyway, okay, so Article 3 basically says there's a Supreme Court. Congress can make other inferior courts like district courts and circuit courts. It says that the judges get to hold their offices during good behavior and that they should be paid at stated times. Section 2 then goes on to lay out what types of cases the Supreme Court has jurisdiction over, basically federal cases where federal or constitutional law is involved, and anything that lower federal courts have heard. And that's it. That's all the Constitution says about the Supreme Court, what it does, and how it should function. It left the rest to Congress to decide. In the Judiciary Act of 1789, the Congress created the rules around the Supreme Court. It created a Supreme Court with six total justices, one chief justice, and five associate justices. So nine justices was not set in stone, if by set in stone you mean written into the Constitution. In fact, the number of justices on the Supreme Court has changed six times before settling on a total of nine. Congress officially settled on nine justices in 1860. Before that year, however, Congress made it a regular practice to change the number of justices to achieve its own partisan political goals. The most there have ever been is 10, which happened during old Abe Lincoln's tenure in office. There have also been some major changes in how the court functions since the mid 1800s. For example, in the Judiciary Act of 1789, the Congress also created district courts and then a number of circuit courts. Those circuit courts at that time didn't have their own separate judges. Instead, they were staffed by one district court judge from the region and then two Supreme Court justices. 
justices. And these circuits were located throughout the US. And this is like the 17 and 1800s. And the justices had to travel around the country to each circuit to hear cases. And so they spent most of the year traveling by horse and buggy all over the country. Like when the Supreme Court was first created, it was not a coveted job, it was a slog. But because of this, there were always justices out and about. So there were rarely issues of a 3-3 split, meaning a tie vote amongst the judges. So they were less concerned about whether there were odd or even numbers of justices. It wasn't until the Judiciary Act of 1891 that circuit courts were created as we know them today with their own judges that stay put. At that point, there were nine justices and that's just how it stayed. The only other part of the constitution that has to do with the Supreme Court comes in Article 2, Section 2, which states that the president shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court. So the president nominates a candidate and the Senate confirms that candidate through a series of confirmation hearings. The way the president picks nominees varies depending on the president. For example, Trump picked Kavanaugh from a list of like 24 potential people. The list was created by conservative legal activists at the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation. Presidents will look at the professional history of the candidate, their apparent political leanings, and race and gender also play a role in the decision process. Then, after the president submits the candidate to the Senate, the Senate holds hearings during which they question the candidate on their qualifications and political leanings, basically a very intense, globally televised job interview that includes the ability for people to come in and act as witnesses to question your character and your fit for the bench. Once the Senate confirms the nominee, they are then sworn in as a justice. Okay, so the number of justices not set in stone. It's set by Congress and can be changed at any time. And the way in which justices are appointed is also set by Congress, but there is now 150 years of precedent for keeping that nomination process and maintaining the court at nine justices. But what about term limits? That is trickier because the Constitution says, like we saw, that the justices will hold their offices during good behavior, which has generally been interpreted to mean lifetime appointments. And that language, though it can be interpreted in different ways, is baked into the Constitution, which makes setting term limits a bit murkier. There is, however, a process for forcibly removing a justice, and it's by impeachment, similar to the impeachment of a president. The justice would have to be impeached by the House and then convicted in a trial by the Senate, which would prompt their removal. There have been two justices in history who have faced the potential of impeachment. Sam Daniel Chase was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and appointed to the Supreme Court by George Washington. Thomas Jefferson didn't like him, so he was impeached on politically motivated charges of acting in a partisan matter during several trials. The Senate, however, acquitted him. In 1969, Abe Fortas, a Lyndon B. Johnson appointee, was threatened with impeachment for acting while on the bench as a paid consultant to the family foundation of a man under investigation for securities fraud. He stepped down before he could be impeached. So in the U.S., we have nine justices and lifetime tenure, and we've had this precedent for so long that it feels like it's the only plausible option, the only way we could run a Supreme Court. But is it? No. No, it's not. In fact, we're the only ones out of other countries like us who do it this way. It might be interesting to take a look at how other countries run their Supreme Courts. In the UK, the Supreme Court has 12 justices who are required to retire at 75 years old and may be removed by both houses of parliament. To choose a candidate to be a Supreme Court justice, a selection commission is created made up of a number of judges and members of parliament. The commission must consult senior judges throughout the UK, as well as first ministers in Scotland and Wales and the Secretary of State of Northern Ireland. Once a candidate has been chosen, they recommend recommend that candidate to the prime minister, who then must recommend that candidate to the queen, who then makes the official appointment. So the political association of the justices has been taken entirely off the table because it's not a choice given to a politician. It's made by a group of unaffiliated judicial appointment board members. Interestingly, the UK Supreme Court was only formed in 2009. Before that, the House of Lords, the upper chamber in parliament, served judicial functions and the judges there were called law lords. I love that. This changed in 2009 to a separate Supreme Court and was meant to create more of a separation between the legislative and judicial functions of government. And it's an example of a country changing the way that their highest judicial power functions on a fundamental level after literally hundreds of years of doing it a different way. However, even before 2009, the Supreme Court in the UK operated differently than the US Supreme Court. Under the UK constitution, the courts cannot nullify laws passed by parliament. They can identify laws that are incompatible with the constitution or the European Convention on Human Rights or something, for example, but that doesn't overrule any law. It then passes the buck back to parliament to then change the law in question. But parliament isn't required to change the law at all, and the Supreme Court doesn't have the power to throw out laws altogether, though usually the pressure of public opinion makes parliament do just that. In Canada, various judicial systems existed from its French and British colonizers, but the Supreme Court of Canada, as it exists now, was created in the Constitution Act of 1867. Justices are appointed in a similar way to the UK, in part because the Queen of England is still technically the Queen of Canada, which I didn't know 
before making this video. But because she's also the Queen of England and of Australia and a bunch of other weird colonial holdouts, she obviously can't be everywhere at once. So in Canada, there's a person called the Governor General who basically acts in the Queen's place. So the Supreme Court justices in Canada are appointed by the Governor in Council, meaning by the Governor General in Council with the federal cabinet. Initially, the court had six justices. In 1927, that number was raised to seven. And in 1949, it was raised again to its current number, nine. In 2016 in Canada, a new process was created and an independent advisory board for the Supreme Court of Canada was created. This group assesses candidates from a list of judges who had to apply to be considered. The advisory board has set rules for criteria by which to assess candidates and is appointed by various groups like the Minister of Justice and the Canadian Bar Association, meaning not politically affiliated groups. Then the advisory board gives the prime minister three to five names to choose from. In the US, as a reminder, there is literally no set process by which the president comes up with his or her nominee. Similarly to the US, the Canadian Supreme Court justices are appointed and serve during good behavior. However, unlike the US, Canada has interpreted this language to allow for a set retirement age, and the justices are required to retire at 75. Additionally, in 1982, Canada expanded the powers of their Supreme Court in the Constitution Act of 1982, which also created new procedures by which to amend the Constitution. It also included a provision for temporarily overriding a Supreme Court decision. This is important because the easier it is to amend the Constitution and the more protections in place for overriding a Supreme Court decision that doesn't require fully amending a difficult to amend document means that the pressure and power given to the Supreme Court is lessened and there are more checks and balances in place. Interestingly, this doesn't mean that the Supreme Court in Canada or the UK where Parliament can ignore the unconstitutionality of a law and enact it anyway. The courts don't lose power or legitimacy in those countries, even though Parliament can technically ignore them. In actuality, public opinion of Supreme Courts in these countries tends to be much higher than the public opinion of the parliament. So not listening to the Supreme Court is generally a big political mistake, but these systems allow for both the Supreme Court and the parliament to shoulder the burden of figuring out what laws are constitutional or unconstitutional and deciding what to do or how to change the laws to fit within the confines of the constitution. Another fun thing that you might not know about the Canadian Supreme Court is that inexplicably their robes look like Santa Claus robes. Unfortunately, these robes are just for very special occasions and aren't worn every day. It's unclear why they still have robes like this, but apparently judges used to color coordinate their robes depending on the type of case they were hearing and would wear red robes when hearing criminal trials. And then they would line their robes with white fur when it got cold outside. So I guess that one just stuck. In Germany, their Supreme Court is called the Federal Constitutional Court. And they have a really complex higher court system and appointment process. There are 16 total justices, eight of whom specifically hear civil matters, while the others only hear criminal matters, and some are then convened as a group to hear special matters. But typically, only five of the judges hear a single case at any given time. Half of the judges are appointed by the upper house of parliament, and the other half by the lower house. Then, the process becomes incredibly political, with an unwritten understanding that in each eight-person panel, four of the judges should come from leftist parties, and four should come from right-leaning parties. And as the political parties in Germany have fractured, smaller parties have gotten seats in the court, like the Green Party and the Free Democrats. Even though this process is very clearly partisan, it actually results in a pretty neutral court, and it requires Parliament to write laws that lean towards the middle of the political spectrum in order to make sure that any Supreme Court decision on the law is a majority decision. And while the judges are given lifetime appointments, they're required to retire once they reach retirement age, which in Germany is 65 to 67 years old, depending on the year of your birth. Okay, and this is obviously just a tiny smattering of information about how other courts function in other countries similar to the US, but it illustrates the fact that no other major Western democracy allows its judges in its highest courts to serve without a term limit or retirement age limit, and that many other countries have figured out ways to balance the power of the judiciary with the power of elected representatives. The precedent that nine justices serve for the entirety of their whole ass lives was created when life expectancy was 40 years. And even state courts within the United States set retirement limits. 32 states have mandatory retirement ages for judges and many have term limits. Okay, so there is clear precedent on how justices are appointed, that they have lifetime tenure, that they have no term limits, and that there should be nine of them. None of that, however, is written into the Constitution. It's simply been set by congressional 
acts that can easily be overridden. Other countries, like Canada and even states within the United States, have interpreted the words good behavior in the Constitution to mean that judges can have a retirement age. If it is arguable whether a judge can be forced off the bench based on the constitutional language good behavior, groups like Fix the Court have argued that justices should be given term limits, after which they can serve on lower courts or fill in on the Supreme Court if there's unexpected vacancy. This way, they're still acting as judges for the remainder of their lives, they're just not given the unfettered ability to serve on the highest court in the land well past their intellectual prime. The problem, however, with the need to interpret the words good behavior in the Constitution and whether that language allows for term limits, if Congress were to pass a law requiring term limits, there would likely be lawsuits challenging its constitutionality, and those lawsuits would, you guessed it, have to ultimately be decided by the Supreme Court itself. So, yeah messy. The group Fix the Court has a list of comprehensive overhauls to the way that the Supreme Court functions that would make the court more accessible to the public while also keeping check over the influence of politics on the judges. They call for increased media and public access to the court through continued live streaming of oral arguments, a practice which only started because of the pandemic but should be continued in order to further the goal of greater public access to the court. The audio has always been released after the fact, but having access to the audio as it's happening gives people the opportunity to hear it before it's been translated by the media. They also call for media to have notification and access to most public appearances made by the justices, because it's weird that the justices are weird about letting media into the courtroom, but then when they have a book to sell, they make appearances on late night talk shows or partisan luncheons. They also call for term limits of 18 years for justices, which would mean that if there are nine justices and a new justice is appointed every two years, then each president could appoint two justices during a four year term of office, creating less likelihood that the court will be packed with picks from a single president. Legal scholars Scholars have argued in favor of a term limit as opposed to a retirement age, saying that a retirement age would just encourage presidents to appoint younger and younger justices, which isn't necessarily a good thing. Is a 35-year-old going to have the knowledge and experience to actually be able to take on such a huge role? As a 30-year-old lawyer, I would argue absolutely not. Okay. They also call for Supreme Court justices to have to make detailed financial disclosures each year and that they should not own individual stocks. They should also be bound by a code of ethics, which they're currently not. There is no official code of ethics for the Supreme Court of the United States. They should also be more open to recusals for potential conflicts of interest, something that is currently very much an issue with this Supreme Court. Others have called for expanding the Supreme Court by adding two to four new justices, something which is not against the Constitution but could have unwanted consequences. First of all, the Democrats would have to use their current control of Congress to override the filibuster because Republicans would absolutely filibuster the hell out of that issue, and then it would open the door to all sorts of other issues. And if Democrats decide to expand the court from nine to 13 justices, there's nothing stopping Republicans when they have control of Congress again from expanding the court from 13 to 15 judges, etc. I read that analysts have run some simulations of this scenario and have found that within 100 years, there would be 50 Supreme Court justices. I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing, but it's something to think about. So because of this and the questionable constitutionality of term limits, we've been stuck as a country in this back and forth hypothetical question of how to rein in what is increasingly becoming an incredible powerful partisan court whose legitimacy is being questioned more and more with each passing term. This legitimacy is being questioned because of the clearly partisan hard line that the current court is taking and because the legitimacy of three out of the nine justices is also questionable. Gorsuch is only on the court because Mitch McConnell made the unprecedented move of blocking Obama's nominee a full year before he was set to leave office. Brett Kavanaugh has been credibly accused of assault, as has Clarence Thomas, whose wife was directly involved in the January 6th uprising. And then Amy Coney Barrett was appointed swiftly while Trump was a lame duck president, despite the precedent that the Gorsuch appointment set. Add on to this that I just read in 538 that Republicans are favored to take over both the Senate and the House this November, and we're truly at an impasse. Basically, what it comes down to is that any reform to the U.S. Supreme Court would have to come from Congress. So the only real way to make those reforms happen is by supporting and voting in politicians who believe in court reform and throwing money and lobbying efforts behind pushing for that reform to happen. Certainly call your representatives in the House and Senate and tell them that court reform is important to you and question the people that you're voting for this year on their stance for court reform. But also I'm getting kind of sick of getting on here and telling you guys that significant changes can happen by just calling your reps. That part is important, but it's not gonna shift the tides, frankly. And I don't think that protesting in the streets will do much either. The way things get done in DC, for better or for worse, comes down to money. Which lobbyists have it, which corporations are paying, what lobbyists to push what agenda, money is power. So I guess I would say become a lobbyist. 
get rich out of pure spite and put the money where you want change to happen, or find and vote people in who are interested in reforming the role that money and private interests play on Capitol Hill. Clearly the will of the people isn't really what drives American government at this point, so looking at what is actually working and using it to advantage your own policy ambitions really seems like the only way forward, which of course leaves the needs of the working class in the dust. And that's just the reality at the moment. And frankly, it's the reality that has always existed in this country. This country was made by moneyed, land-owning white men who didn't want to pay taxes in order to protect their own interests. Sorry to be a Debbie Downer today, but that's just where I'm at <laughs> on this issue. I hope this was at least informative. I had fun learning about how other countries' judicial systems work. I had fun fantasizing about living in those other countries instead of this trash fire. So hopefully you came along for that fantasy with me. And that's all, folks. After that, I think I need a nap. Luckily, the sponsor of today's video is Helix Sleep. I truly love my Helix mattress and I want you to get rested too. Remember to click the link in the description or go to helixsleep.com slash Lija for up to $200 off your Helix Sleep mattress. Thanks, Helix. Thank you also to my Patreon supporters. I'm so happy to have you become a part of our community. Thanks especially to the newest VIP members, Angie McNye, Coco Nuts, and Bobby. And thanks always to my royal and multi-platinum patrons, Old Man Pence, Fork Big Spoon, Ellen L, Daniel Taylor, and Brett Piontek. If you're interested in getting in on the fun, check out the link to my Patreon below for exclusive access to behind the scenes content, my upcoming video scripts, handwritten postcards featuring my perfect dog Moira, Leija's book club, and so much more. If you like this video, you might also like my video all about the history and Supreme Court precedent of the 14th Amendment's privacy protections. Thanks for watching, have a good day, bye bye